I'll like have that idea or like realize, oh, that's the person I need to reach out to. It's or cliche, I should have asked this question. But you really start uh, with the people you know. A few and, months uh, ago now about about a woman named Sandra Bland. Mm -hmm. I'm Steve Wadhams, and I have been uh, a radio nut since 1968 um, at the BBC, starting out as a technician and 41 years at CBC Radio. I have picked five pieces which, in my mind, take us on a journey from constraint, where the documentary form is kind of imprisoned, um, in a studio-bound environment in its past, uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, that golden age of radio, which was studio-based, to the liberating of, 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 the, of recordings, of sound, of um, thanks to new, new technology, new tape machines, portable tape machines, liberating that to go outside the studio, out into the field, to free the radio form. Uh, from the 1950s. It's 1957. It's a BBC production. It's called The Ballad of John Axon. John Axon, it's a real story. John Axon was a steam engine driver or engineer, I guess, in England in the 50s. And he had the misfortune to have a steam pipe break on his locomotive. And the locomotive went out of control down a hill. And he risked his life, gave his life, because he tried to stay on the train and stop it crashing into a village where it would have killed a lot of people. And the BBC asked um, some people to make a tribute piece to John Axon. Um, so in 57, two folk singers, I guess you could call uh, Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger, and a very talented BBC producer by the name of Charles Parker, were set loose to try and do this piece. They went out um, to interview the widow of John Axon, and his mates, these guys who worked with him in the engine sheds on the steam trains. And they recorded interviews with these people, not super high quality, but not bad, because technology was still pretty heavy in those days. And they had originally planned to make it a studio feature, because that's what you did in those days. You took what people said on tape, you transcribed it, you made edits for it, you, you picked what you wanted, you put that into the voice of actors, and you did it all in studio. So you never heard the voices of the real people. But that was the concept. That's what they were expecting to do. Then somebody, I think it was Charles Parker, maybe both of them, McCall, had this brilliant idea. Can you imagine a light bulb moment? What if we actually use some of the tapes we recorded with the widow, with the guys in the engine sheds? Could we do that? Could we use that instead of putting it into actors' voices? Oh, sure we can. It was 4 a.m. that Saturday, John Axon left his bed. At five he drew his time card at Edgeley Loco Shed. Just after six runs Scanlon, his fireman cried away. It was a day no different from any other day. dark when I got to the shed up to Saturday morning. Jack was waiting there. Come on, Ron, he said, we want to get finished. Let me see. You're never early at that time in the morning. It's bad enough having to get there at the right time. And as I walked in the driver's lobby, there were a lot of choice comments going on around about the weather. Morning, Ronnie. Morning, Ernest. Morning. Very rough. Morning. Yes, one, five, six, please, Johnny. Thank you. Too rough. What engine have we got? 51 ETA. Already? Right. Come on. Better, so we better go. Come on, let's go and get ready. Right. I'm in a re mood this morning. Ready? Come on. Wife's comfortable. 
pay. Iron Road is a hard road, and the work is never ending. Working night and day on the Iron Way, we're the boys who keep the engines rolling. So here, it's, it's an amazing mix of, I would call, big ideas and amazingly small, powerful, intimate audio sequences. For example, the first one, um, it's, I, I can hear it in my head now, it's, it's, it's the birth of a bell, as they say. He says, no one can see the birth of a bell. You can only hear it because it's made underground, because you cast the bell with liquid metal, molten metal underground. What you hear is this amazing bubbling sound as the molten metal comes up through the feeder pipes up into the, I guess, the, sh the shell, the mold. I'm not quite sure exactly how it works. But he used that sound, was recorded so amazingly, and he has such confidence in using it. He doesn't just edit it down to 20 seconds and talk over it. He lets it sit. He lets you hear it. And then there's this amazing trans transposition from the bubbling of the metal to the sound of the actual finished product, the bell. To me, that's a magical transition, and it's, it, it sticks in my mind and probably will forever. Nachts, um 2 Uhr, bekam der Schmelzofen seinen ersten Kupferbarren zu fressen. Und dann immer runter in den glühenden Bauch. Mit dem Zinn zusammen 75 Cent. Die Glockenspeise. If um, the microphone was liberated or the sound was liberated by the bells in Europe, I would say it was truly set free uh, and allowed to show what it can do in the Danish features of the 1990s. At least that's how I've heard them. This was where the microphone goes so close, up close and personal. It, it I heard a piece called Son of the Family, S-U-N of the Family. It's a play on words because it's about a son, S-O-N, of the family, a young guy who sadly in Copenhagen committed suicide. And the story is told by his girlfriend and his parents and also through his own voice but only in the form of his diaries. So those are the elements of the documentary. Mads Bastrup was the producer in Radio Denmark and he uh, spent, he told me that he met the girlfriend, for example, 15 times to get the trust and to get the depth of emotional depth and that he needed for this story. So this is where you have to, as a producer, really take the effort to, un to get into the psychology of the story, to an emotional, uh, the emotions within it, take the time to get people's trust and get the mic in close. I asked Mads Bastrop, how did you get this incredible intimate sound with your recordings that, that you almost feel the people's voices as much as hear them? And he just said, very brusquely actually, uh, I thought, get a good mic and put it in close. And I thought that was just fine. <laughs> I i matematik timerne så har han flygtet væk i drømme. Det er meget nok gjort. Ja, det kan man også se på det billede, der hænger derude i køkken med de store øjne. Det er, der, der. Det er som om han retter blikket indad allerede på det billede derude i, i køkkenet. Og det er, bliver han i hvert fald ved med. Vi er i en stue i Vestjylland. Bag stuen ligger værelserne, hvor Anders og hans tre søskende boede, før de flyttede hjemmefra. Og inde bagved ligger også notaterne, brevene, dagbøgerne og historierne, som Anders skrev, fra han var helt ung. En dag fødes du frisk og glad, men allerede da lurer faren. En dag bliver du voksen og skal se, hvad du dur til. Måske bliver du rig, måske fattig, måske bliver du trist og begynder at drikke. Måske bliver du en berømt kunstner. Måske er du bange og marerigt, 
Men et er sikkert. Du ældes. Outfront was a breakthrough, a CBC breakthrough, a Canadian breakthrough. It uh, came from the idea that the taxpayers, CBC taxpayers, the people who put us on the radio, should actually have a voice, a regular voice. It was the door that had to open, as the manager of the time put it. So Outfront was a five nights a week, 15 minute slot, and we produced about 1,200 short documentaries Every one of them, I would say, with few exceptions, were pitched to us by members of the public. This is kind of a new way of working for us as producers. It was, I used to call it documentary midwifery. I mean, my job as a producer was to liberate the baby, really, literally, in the person and bring it to its fullest and most powerful and beautiful fruition as a radio feature. And other, other organizations came looking, you know, BBC came sniffing. Australian came, uh, broadcasting came sniffing. Everybody noticed it. The Americans noticed it. But you know what stopped them? It was the money. It was very expensive. I think it gave credence to the idea that radio professionals weren't the only ones who should decide what goes on the radio. Um, that the range of stories we did were unheard of because how on earth would you know what stories were out there until somebody told you? How would the, someone like Darren O'Donnell, which is an example I could play, who had mental problems, uh, m made a piece which he called Crazy Like a Fox. And he worked with a very talented producer, Lawrence Stevenson, to make this happen on the radio. It's just one example of, and the styles that these people, we tried always to help to find the form of storytelling that fitted the, ne the actual story. So don't impose a cookie cutter idea. Don't even impose my own idea, but let them bring their ideas, work to their strengths. Hi, I'm Darren O'Donnell in Toronto. Welcome to Outfront. Crazy people have a bad reputation. It's not our fault. For the most part, we don't really do anything all that wrong. Maybe we occasionally behave in a way that confuses our more staid brothers and sisters, but by and large, the reputation we have for following the commands of voices to kill, 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 kill. is a whole lot of hype. Kill. I've been crazy now for about six years, and many of my nuttiest experiences are the best times I've ever had. They're mystical, meaningful, massive, and muddling. They're marvelous, mischievous, disconcerting, and utterly aptly, wing ding dag napperly, happily, heartwarmingly horrifying. They're the meat in the reality sandwich you just don't know how to chew. They're the teeth in an hallucinatory, how you doing, that knows how to bite back. Youch! <laughs> Was that you, or did psychosis just nip my ass? Well, I think the true liberation now is the podcast. Because now, if you want to make a piece of radio, whether you want to tell it as a drama, a comedy, a zany piece of whatever, a documentary, whatever you want to do, you, you don't need the permission or the control of a CBC or a BBC or an NBC or any of those organizations. The gatekeepers fall away. You can make whatever you want now, especially with, you know, everybody has digital multi-track, you can, and you can upload it to the web, this is all new. So you can produce and disseminate. That was always a problem. Getting it out there was always a problem before the internet. So now you can do that. There are some podcasts which are famous and have become amazingly influential. Everybody talks about serial and tries to make the next serial. But you know, so what? There's hundreds of people out there doing it. Um, the one that, I, that caught my ear I, is a Canadian one. Uh, the uh, Illusionoid, I believe they call it. It's crazy. It's fun. Um, it's, I don't know what it is. They have different episodes every, every week, of course. And it's freewheeling and it's zany. Tonight's transmission. I've taken up weaving. I find what fabric I can in this abandoned moon base. It's usually the remains of human hair that I find in corners of rooms and under pillows. I just hope we keep taking risks. You know, for me, it, the whole thing for me has been to try to keep pushing out, not to keep doing what I know works. It's easier, safer, and more reliable, especially if you're on contract, to do what works and not what you think is dangerous or exciting or experimental. Maybe a little less now with podcasts. I think that the, it's, it's just keeping the imagination alive, you know? just keeping it alive. 
the, I mean, the, theater, the radio, you can go anywhere in radio, anywhere in the mind. So go anywhere and everywhere. Do it. <laughs>